The title of the message is Designed to Create. This is really a follow-up from last week's message, and that is that God is, or is God really that good? And we talked about the fact of uh, he wants to show his goodness to the world, and he does it through us. This is a message really is practical in the sense of how do we take that goodness that he wants to give to us and show, and how do we make that evident in the world today? So that's kind of where we're going. And if you have your Bibles, open up to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to be looking at this chapter and uh, all the way down through most of the whole chapter and really pulling out things that will help us understand that. This week, uh, Mike, uh, he has a landscape uh, mowing company, and he invited me to the Mid-Atlantic Nursery Show. And it doesn't have anything to do with children. It has to do with trees and shrubs and and grass and soils and all the related industries that are part of that. And as we walk down through the, uh, the aisles, again, looking at uh, many tree nurseries, every once in a while you come across somebody, a booth, that had taken something that was already invented, simple, and they would creatively add to it and turn it into a new product. And one of those we saw was a simple pitchfork. And it was kind of it had wide, uh, wide tongs to it. And the intent was that you dig into the ground and whatever shrub you wanted to take out. And normally, you know, most of us know what a pitchfork is. You dig into the ground and you had to use your back in order to pull that out. What they did was they took a, a little rainbow type extension on the back so that as all you did, you pushed it into the ground. You just pushed down on the, on the, the, the fork itself and it actually, you know, came out and you saved your back. What a novel idea. And this person just figured it out, a creative design, simple design, taking something, improving, and now he's at a national show making it big. All right. I mean, that's amazing how people take simple things and they have an idea, they improve on that idea, and the world goes, wow, we've never seen anything like that before. Now, I don't know if the, the people in the booth, I don't know if they knew Jesus, I don't know if they spent extensive time in prayer to come up with that or not. Probably just went, oh, my back hurts. I wonder how to save it. And they came up with that idea, which is uh, sometimes how things get developed. So designed to create. Jesus said in John 15, 8, This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So Jesus said that his desire, as we live in this world, is to bear much fruit. That is, that we would be the ones that would be able to create, design for the glory of God, to show the goodness of God to others as we do that. So how does that happen? Well, we're going to find out today. One of the things that, that I realize is to be created in the image of God means that you and I have been given the spiritual, emotional, intellectual DNA to create. Yet most of us disqualify ourselves because we don't think we're inventors. We don't think that we're engineers. We don't think we're architects. And we don't think that we are the ones that are creative enough to come up with an idea that could actually be something new. And yet I want to inform you this morning that if you are a follower of Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are designed to create because that is the nature of God. And yet we don't think that way. The world has relegated that off to somebody else that invents or, or you know, designs or whatever. And we just kind of follow, not, really, not realizing that God has given us that same ability in the field and area in which we work and live. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, first of all, we've got to walk through some stages in life. And we're going to talk about these three stages that if we understand how God uh, w that how God teaches us and schools us in each one of these stages, then we'll get to the place where we begin to think like God creates and design, and we'll be open to that as well. When God gave a mandate to Adam and Eve, he first of all said this. He said to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, and subdue it. That was the mandate that God gave Adam and Eve, and that's still in effect for us. He said, be fruitful. And then he said, Mult learn how to multiply that. And then he says, you know, take over the earth. And he says, get her done. That's kind of what, what God gave Adam and Eve. And so he gives the same thing, thing to, to us 
And we have to realize sometimes that we get into this world and, and, and get pounded uh, in one particular stage that I'm going to talk about, and we begin to, to think that we don't have the ability or power to create or design as we were, again, gifted to. Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 8. Uh, as we look at this, Moses is giving the second generation of the children of Israel, he's giving them instructions. A brief history lesson, and he's given them instructions. Basically what he's saying in chapter 8, and we'll get into it, is that you came out of Egypt, out of slavery. You went through the wilderness, and now you're getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And there's things that you need to understand and remember of what you came out of, what you came through, and where God has taken you into. Three different stages. And God shows us things, and we learn things from Him and about ourselves in each one of those three stages. So let's take a look. Deuteronomy chapter chapter 8. What we learn from, he says in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 8, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase, there it is, and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Moses is saying, pay attention. Now the people that he's talking to, there was nobody 60 years old or older. See, they had all died off except three, uh, Caleb, uh, Caleb, Joshua, and Moses. They were older. And then you have those that were um, 40 years old and under, they were born in the wilderness. So they knew nothing about Egypt. And then the group from 40 to 60 years old, they were born in Egypt, but some of them were too young to remember. And this is the group of people that he's talking to, to prepare them, to remind them of what they came out of, what they came through, and then to prepare them for what they are going into. So he begins to, to then teach them. And the first thing we learn in the slavery stage or the Egypt stage is being enslaved by Egypt. In, in that particular stage, you never have enough. You never have enough. And, and the way that it, that it happens is that when you work or go through life, you, um, there's no favors. It's all hard work. There's no breaks. There's no appreciation expressed. And the system that you're in only multiplies stress. Now, some of you can probably relate because you may be in a system like that right now. That the reality of it is, when you go to work, it's hard. It's frustrating. You never get commended. You never get appreciated. You may never get a raise. You may never get bonuses. But you're there because you're just there. And it's a system that is adding stress to your life, not an enjoyable thing to do. I was reminded of a friend of mine that was working at a car a business in sales and uh, he, was, he was doing really great. He was very efficient at what he did. And, and uh, all of a sudden, the boss comes through and says, we're not meeting our sales quota, therefore no more lunches. We'll bring in lunch. You have, to, you have to work through your lunch because we're not meeting our quotas. And my friend decided, I'm out. I work 12 hours a day here, and you're taking away my lunches? No, I'm not going to be in this system any longer. And so he left. And again, found another job, and God's blessing him greatly. But we can get into places like that where that's all that's demanded. It's absolutely stressing us out, wearing us out. That's Egypt. And what we need to realize is that God has a way out of that. God has a way. He says, I'm going to come and rescue you. The people thought that was their lot for all their life. And God said, no, I'm sending Moses down. And he let the people know that he was God and is going to bring them out. Let's look at Deuteronomy Chapter 5, verse 15. A couple of chapters earlier, and Moses said this again to those people. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So he's telling this group of people, remember where God has brought you out of. Then in chapter 6, verse 12, he says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The children of Israel thought that they were trapped with no hope. And when we're in that kind of system or slavery, trapped with no hope, and yet God says, no, I'm going to bring you out of that. And it may be a struggle to come out. 
If you're trapped, maybe you're trapped in an addiction, or maybe you're trapped in an unhealthy relationship, or maybe you're trapped in a system at work that, again, is just is heavy to carry. All of those things that you're trapped, and you feel like, there's no way out of this. And God says, yes, it is. Sometimes it's just changing perspectives that releases us. Sometimes it's not going out of the situation. And sometimes we have to recapture why we're there. So it's not just necessarily quitting your job and leaving. Sometimes it's going back to God, as we heard this morning, and getting his perspective of why we're there. And sometimes it may mean leaving. But anyhow, getting out of Egypt is a struggle. It took them 10 miracles to get out. (laughs) That's a lot. And yet they came out. And when they came out, they, they again got some hope that they weren't trapped any longer. And the, and the next thing that happened is they moved into the wilderness. Oh, really? Well, the wilderness had something to teach the people and it has something to teach us at all. So they wandered in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, it's just enough. In Egypt, it's never enough. Never enough strength. Never enough understanding. Never enough appreciation. But in the wilderness, it's just enough. Meaning that God begins to father his people and he'll begin to father you in a way that you didn't even ask for. I mean, you didn't ask to be taken care of. They didn't know what they needed and God says, I'm going to take care of you and you're going to have just enough. Let's read a couple of scriptures to kind of of back that up. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, 8 verse 2, we see, and I'm going to read down through 5 and then 15 Uh, through uh, 18. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart. See, that's what God is, is doing in the wilderness time, to test us and to see if we'll trust him. Even though it doesn't look like he can provide, he still does. Whether or not you would keep his commandments, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your, fo- your fathers had known. In other words, they didn't even know they needed manna. And God says, I'm going to feed you anyhow. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 4, your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell. They didn't ask for that. God just provided And to know what was in your heart, as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord disciplines you. And then in 15 and 16, it says this. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land, with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you out, he brought water out of a hard rock. See, the wilderness experience begins to deepen within us a trust for God. And that's his whole purpose. Will you trust me? Even though it looks like there's no way provision can come, but God says, no, I'm going to trust you because you're in a wilderness time. So it's trust for provision. The question I have for you this morning, jumping through, is can you trust God for provision in your wilderness? And he said, it's just enough. I'll take care of you. Can you trust him for finances? Can you trust him for healing? Can you trust him to restore relationships that are broken? Can you trust him to get a a raise at work? Can you trust him that you'll find a job with the best skill set? That's all about trusting God that that is, is important. It's daily trust. Trust for bread. They wanted meat. God gave them meat, water, clothes, not wearing out. I mean, God had this in mind all along as they're walking through the wilderness. Will you trust me? There wasn't much else out there, and so it became pretty evident that they needed to. How long were they in the wilderness? Forty years. I thought, does it have to take that long in our life? Forty years? Come on now. And the thought hit me is that Jesus, after he was baptized in water, it says he was led into the wilderness. So Jesus went into the wilderness. We, we can't, we shouldn't avoid the wilderness. But how long was Jesus there? Forty days. Forty years for the children of Israel, forty days for Jesus. What's the difference? The children of Israel didn't have the Holy Spirit living within them. That's how long it takes to train the flesh. But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit when you go into the wilderness, then it should only take 40 days. And you should be good. I'm not starting a new doctrine. It's just a thought. I like it, though. I'd rather spend 40 days learning my lesson than 40 years. 
And obviously Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are too. So we can have a wilderness for 40 days, not 40 years. And if you're in a longer than that, I think we need to question why we're there. But we can get the answer quickly. See, once we've learned to trust and nothing else is available and God comes through, then we're ready to cross over into the promised land. That's the purpose of the wilderness. So as we dive into the promised land, being established in the promised land is more than enough. In Egypt, it was never enough. The promised land, it was just enough. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, in the wilderness, it was just enough. And now in the promised land, it's more than enough. Where are you living today? Are you living in Egypt? Are you living in the wilderness? Are you living in the promised land? So we need to learn to understand how God uh, expects us to create and to grow and to be fruitful in the promised land. It's different from the wilderness and it's different from being in slavery in Egypt. Once we learn to trust, then God brings us into the promised land and we have to forget or we have to remember not to stop trusting. Let me again read Deuteronomy chapter 8, 6 through 9. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing, with valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates and olive oil and honey a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Wow. Is that amazing raw resources available that God put there in order for his people to enjoy and have more than enough? Now the question is, if those resources are there... How then are they put into practice or how are they then um, uh, 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 mined and learned? Well, that's, that's, that's what has to happen. You see, when you get into the promised land, it's about sowing and reaping. It's not about waiting for the next miracle. It's not about wishing you would get out. It's actually you begin to sow and reap in order to experience what God has for you in the promised land and to have more than enough. He's given you the raw resources. Now, you and I have to learn how to take those resources that God has given us and to create and make them into what he wants uh, them to be through his help. In other words, the children of Israel coming into the promised land, they had to learn how to farm. They had to learn how to shear sheep. They had to learn how to milk goats. They had to learn how to tap olive trees. They had to learn how to harvest barley and thresh wheat. And they had to learn how to make wine and mine copper and melt iron. They had to learn those things. They didn't learn that in Egypt. They didn't learn that in the wilderness. When they came into the promised land, they had to get their books and through experience and asking people and trial and error, they had to take the raw resources that God had given them and begin to develop them into what God had in mind so that they would have more than enough. They developed an economy out of these raw resources and materials. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few moments and make some comparison between these three stages. If you have your pen, get it up. You write fast. Uh, maybe I'll dump these in the, the newsletter this week because I think they're that valuable for you to read and to uh, kind of uh, ponder again. I was inspired. These came from Jim Baker. Uh, he's a pastor in uh, Ohio, Zion Christian Fellowship, I believe it is. And uh, then, you know, uh, as, you, as you, I don't know about you, but I'm listening to people, uh, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. So uh, these kind of started with him and got flavored with the Holy Spirit in me, all right? <laughs> Here we go. In a slave environment, there's never enough. In the wilderness, there's just enough. In the promised land, there's more than enough. If you don't learn to trust God in the wilderness, you will never trust him in the promised land because there are far more distractions there. In the wilderness, trust was for provision, but in the promised land, trust is for promotion. In the wilderness, miracles sustained you, but in the promised land, they testify to the goodness of God. 
In the land of slavery, miracles got you out. In the wilderness, miracles kept you alive. But in the promised land, miracles declare who reigns. They take up, miracles take out giants. They break down walled cities. And they establish you in your living environment. That's what miracles do in the promised land. We start in slave systems for us to long for something more. The wilderness is a school for us to learn, but never supposed to be the end result of where you and I live. If you try to jump from slavery to the promised land without wilderness time, you will lose trust when God blesses you because you begin to think you did it. If trusting God doesn't become a delight for you, then you have some growing up to do. We need to trust God equally in the wilderness and the promised land to rely on Him to help us in developing the resources that He's made available to us. In the promised land, God blesses the work of your hand, not the derriere in the couch. Do I need a translation? I try to keep the four-letter words out of the pulpit. He blesses the work of your hand, not your derriere in the couch. In the wilderness, you sat around and God did miracles for you. That's not that way in the promised land. If you want to live that way, you'll have just enough. But if you want to move into the promised land more than enough, you've got to get up and work. Because that's the way God designed it. Maybe that's the message that needs to go out today in our nation, huh? Yeah. If you allow fear to come back in after you've built trust, you take back control and you enter your own recession. In the wilderness, you get used to Amazon now, but in the promised land, you must learn to sow and wait and reap. If you try and live off miracles in the promised land, you will never learn anything. If you try to live off of miracles in the promised land, you'll never live and learn anything. Okay, I think I'm done. So, Again, I'll probably put these in the newsletter this week so you can kind of reflect and, and dive into them a little more and let God speak to you. Number two, God designed us to bring order out of chaos. How does this happen? First of all, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and look at how God created. And what was the situation with which he created? It says that God was there and the world was what? formless and void. The world was in chaos. And what did God do? It says that he hovered over the darkness and the, that which was unformed and that which is in chaos. He hovered over through the Holy Spirit. And he stayed there until what he had in mind actually began to form because of his hovering. And as a result of that, then that chaos came into order and he stepped back when it was done and he said, that's good. And that's the way he wants you and I to create, that we actually step into that which is out of order, that which is in disorder, that which is in chaos, that which is in darkness. He wants you and I, the light of the world, to run into those places and begin to hover, pray over that or disorder, that chaos, that which is out of order, whatever it is, and begin to ask God to bring into order that which is out of order. And then when it comes, we step back and say, that's good. Good. That's how God creates. So maybe you and I, and we do this in a charismatic setting, we curse the darkness. We say the enemy lives there. Maybe our destiny is in there rather than staying out. Just a thought. Maybe that's where God wants us because nobody else will go there. The world can't figure it out, they're clueless. It's time for God's people to realize how we've been created so that we can walk into those places that are out of order and bring order. John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples, verses 13 through 15. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, <clears throat> he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. 
Verse 15. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And that is why I said that the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Are you catching this? The world doesn't have access to the Holy Spirit. And so when you don't have access to the Holy Spirit, you're, you're, you're kind of at a loss a lot of times. But since we have access to the Holy Spirit, then we cheat. Because we have access to God, and so we actually, where the world is confused and struggling and in chaos, we actually cheat because we have access to God Himself through the Holy Spirit that we can walk into those settings and give answers and give clarity and give direction when the world wants it, but they don't know how to get it. But we have access to it. Are you catching me? And so we have to realize that the moment that we get, uh, say yes to Jesus and get filled with the Holy Spirit, we have this uh, design ability to, cre to create. And the way God created, he started with nothing and brought forth something that was like, wow. And he said it is good. And so he wants us to walk in those same ways and understanding. You know, we uh, order a product online and it comes in pieces in a box. So what do we do? We open up the box and take out all the pieces and get the directions. And my wife reads the directions in my house because I wouldn't necessarily read the directions. I would just get in on it and, you know, jump in and go. And so you take that which is disassembled and you assemble it all together and there's one screw left out, right? <laughs> And so you go out to your, 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 your you know, you, everybody has a, you know, a, 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 screw, a screw box, right? <laughs> everybody has a screw box, right? So you find one that works, you put it together, you go, wow, that's good. But when you got it, it was disassembled and you needed to put it together. And there's instructions to do that. That's what Moses is telling the people here is that when you get into promised land, you have to take the raw material and you're going to have to put it together. And then when you get done, it's going to go, Wow. That's amazing. And God did it. God helped you along the way. You know, it's like baking a pie or baking, baking in, the, in the house. You know, you get out all the ingredients and, and you got flour all over the walls, on the floor and everything. But when you get done, whatever you made is good. And people enjoy it and there's more than enough. I don't know if I'm talking about anybody in the way they cook, but somebody here. So God runs into chaos and he hovers and he stays there until what he has in mind begins to form and it comes out and it's good. God started with formless, void, empty darkness and he brought good out of it. God's order here is this, it's a point. God's order is to move from simple to chaos. I mean, let me get this straight. God's order is to move from simple to complex. <laughs> The world oftentimes complicates things. Now, they might start simple and then they get complicated and you're like, I don't want to do that. I call that bureaucracy. And so then you have to go back and simplify. How does God start? He starts simple. You ever read how he created the earth? He said, let there be light. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Darkless. Then let there be day. Let there be night. Let there be stars. He started simple. But by the day six, it was pretty complex, wasn't it? I mean, there was an ego system that was functioning that was like, wow. But he didn't start that way. He started simple. The same way with us. If we got massive problems, we don't know what to do. You need to stop and ask God, what is the one simple thing that I can start doing that is then going to move into bringing order to that which is chaotic? Like, for instance, the marriage. The, uh, lots of times people are chaotic and they're, I don't know what to do. Okay, here's one thing you do. Pray together. Not at one another. <laughs> Pray together. Pray to God together. You do it five minutes a day, something will begin to change in your marriage. That's simple. And yet, it works. Because you're inviting God to come in and bring order to that which is out of order. So you start simple. It's not hard. And that's how God does. Let, let me just walk down through this, this uh, kind of uh, way that, that God does it. In Deuteronomy 8, 7, it says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. That's simple. Okay, God, we're going into a good land. Going to be more than enough. What happens next? The next is in verse 7, the uh, last part of, 
I mean, yes, verse 7 through 9, it says this. It's a land with streams, pools of water, springs flowing with valley and hills, land with wheat and honey, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey, land where bread will not be scarce, you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig out copper from the hills. All right. So that, it again, is laying out the resources that God has provided in order for you to have more than enough. The ability, then, he gives you the ability to develop those. And that is seen in verses 10 through 13. When you have eaten and are satisfied, what does it mean? It means that you've taken the raw materials and you made it into food and bread. And you're satisfied. It's good. And the, uh, um, praise the Lord, your God, for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands and laws and decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, you will build fine houses. You build fine houses out of raw material. And you settle down. You're like, this is where I want to be forever. And your herds and your flocks grow. Your business expands. And your silver and gold increases. Your bank account comes up. And all that you have is multiplied then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See, the purpose of the wilderness is to establish such trust with God that when you get into the promised land and you have all this, the, these, this blessing that you're managing that you never forget to trust God. And that's the purpose of the wilderness, establishing trust. God has the power to create, so he gives us that same ability as well. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe you and I need to think differently in the way that we are living today. Are we living in slavery, or living in wilderness, or living in a promised land? Number three, the key to increasing fruitfulness. He says in verse 18, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth, so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors as it is today. I'm gonna, I need to back up and read the two verses preceding verse 18 because it gives us the context. Here we go. Verse 16 says, He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers never knew, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. We may say to you, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength of hands has produced this wealth. And then we get to verse 18. But remember, the Lord your God, it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. The key to understanding increasing fruitfulness is to credit God with the fact that his power is working through you. His power is working through you. Let me ask you a question. If I would say, what is your definition of wealth, what would you say? What would you say your definition of wealth is? Is it the house that you live in? Is it the car that you drive? Is it the balance of your bank account? Is it the business that you operate? Is it the property value that you live on? Is that considered wealth? I want to suggest to you that the way God thinks about wealth is when you and I add value to whoever and whatever situation we're in. We add value. You see, you can have creation wealth and you can have extraction wealth. Creation wealth is when you actually add value to that person or situation, and as a result, they have a wow experience that you say, well, that's the goodness of God coming out for you to enjoy. And extraction wealth is like taxes. <laughs> I mean, what's happening? With, uh, taxes are extracted out from us. People actually become wealthy on the taxes that we give, and they're supposed to be for the benefit of our good, and yet in reality sometimes they're extracting out rather than actually creating what should be created. God says, I want you to have a creative wealth, not an extractive wealth. Extractive wealth is you're just in it for the money. 
and not for the benefit of those getting your product or are they, are they begin being encouraged by it. That's an extraction wealth. God says, no, I want my people to be a creative wealth, that you're actually adding value to those that you interact with. And so that's my definition of wealth that I want to submit to you today because that's what God does. Jim shared about his 18-year-old son that went to work his first job at a sandwich shop. And he understood this growing up in the household. And so uh, before he went to his first day, his son memorized the menu. So he walked in the door having memorized the menu. And then as he started work, he began to notice things that could be done better. So he made a note. And he went to the manager and said, hey, uh, look, we could do this and this would help this. And the manager said, wow, it's a great idea. And he began to actually develop a manual of ways that they could do things different in the sandwich shop that would actually add value to the customers coming in and how to make sandwiches. They didn't, he didn't realize, but the company was actually assessing him and, and, and how he was moving through. And, 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 and so they actually put him in other stores. And every store that he was in, this young kid, it would prosper. It would begin to turn around because he just thought that way. He walked into the store saying, I'm going to add value to every, the environment that I'm around. As a result of that, he got blessed and he got compensated for it. He said they had older people that would wait one hour until Jim started his shift because they liked him making their sandwich. That's adding value, isn't it? Just an example of what can happen when we begin to think this way, that God has called us to bring wealth to wherever we're at, God's goodness, and we do so by adding value to those that we interact with. How do we help them? How do we help them out of a jam? How do we help them to understand something different? Maybe they don't have the truth. Maybe they're believing a lie and we bring them the truth and help them understand how it can benefit them. A different way to live. Have you ever had a wow moment in your life? I mean, what am I saying? A wow moment is when you, you expected something and you, you went there and you did whatever you were, uh, you know, going to do. And as a result of, of, of what you walked into, suddenly what you experienced was way beyond anything that you could ask or imagine. You ever had that happen to you? I mean, yeah, I've had that happen to me several times. In fact, I remember probably just a year in pastoring, I went to this pastor's conference. I met this guy named Jeff in Southwest Virginia. Long story short, he ended up inviting me to come down and teach on Free Me Day. I mean, it was basically Free Me Day that we do here. I taught that way back when and taught his whole church, took him through a, through a day. But uh, I was getting ready to go, and about midway through the week before I was going to leave, all of a sudden there was this vase of flowers that showed up in my office. Now, I'm not necessarily into flowers, but it was just a thought, right? Uh, I wanted to like the flowers, but I was like, well, this is crazy. I, I don't even know these people, and they sent me flowers before I left. I got there, and immediately when I got out of the car, they brought these big bags of goodies. They said, we just want to bless your wife and your kids. They got the names of all my kids and their ages, and it was just full of toys and food, and they were just carrying these things out. I hadn't done anything yet. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, they treated me well. They took my car keys and washed my car while I was teaching. They, they, they fed me, they put me up, and they gave me an honorarium that I was just scared to take. I mean, it was like, whoa, this is way beyond what I deserve. It was a wow moment. You see, God wants you and I to take those wow moments and give those to others. That's the goodness of God being displayed. And if you practice that, if you purpose to do that for the goodness of God, not the paycheck... The goodness of God, I guarantee you, you will have more than enough in your life because that's how God lives. Again, I'm transitioning your thought of how we normally think. When you start pursuing money rather than serving people, you have just left the kingdom of God. Thomas Edison said this. He said, people miss many opportunities because the opportunity appears dressed in overalls and looks like work. <laughs> That's a good word. Living the promised land requires work. But God gives you the raw resources. And he gives you the know-how. And he gives you the understanding that when you get done with whatever you're doing, that it's going to be good and you're going to enjoy it and others are going to enjoy it with you. What a way to live. See, God chooses to involve us. Proverbs 16, 9, the uh, Amplified. 
says this, a man's, and a woman could fit in here equal as well, a man's heart, a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. If we don't plan, God's not going to establish our steps because he doesn't have plans. We provide the plans. God provides the steps. It's his power works through. Jesus is clear that he wants to show forth his goodness through us. The question is, where are we living? And what are we living out of? Some of you have been cursing your darkness. Maybe it's time to start hovering over that darkness in prayer. And saying, God, show me this one simple thing that you want to change. In order to begin to bring alignment to release your goodness over that setting. Here's the questions for you in closing. Are you trapped in Egypt? If you're trapped in Egypt, you'll be thinking, I never have enough. I never have enough. I never have enough strength. I never have enough energy. I never have enough emotions. I never have enough, no, I never have enough money. I never have, I never have enough friends. I, I just never have enough. That's living in Egypt. God says, I want to rescue you out of that place. It might take 10 miracles to get you out, <laughs> but we're going to do this thing. And God was committed to the children of Israel. He's committed to you if you're living in a land of slavery. Bless you. Are you stuck in the wilderness? That's just enough. Just enough. God says that when, if you're living at just enough, will you, will you then acknowledge, God, I trust you? I don't know if I'll be paid next week. I don't know if the company will be bankrupt or what's going on. But I'm going to just trust you, God. You tell him that then you're ready to walk into the promised land. But you've got to come to that place because that's the sole purpose of the wilderness. He's, take, he's taking care of you in ways that you never ask for. And that's just what he does. He wants to show you he's a good father, just like he showed the children of Israel. But there comes a point in time when you, that trust is established. If it's not, when you get into the promised land and you get blessed way beyond your socks can handle... You'll forget him and you'll say, I did this. And man, you're headed for trouble fast. You'll go down quickly. In fact, he says that at the end of the chapter. You get into the promised land and you get blessed. You get nice houses and fine cars and good jobs and, and, and busting bank accounts. And you forget me. He says at the end of this chapter, you're going you're gonna to be sliding down the other way quicker than you can imagine. He gives a warning. We need to heed that warning. All right, you're in the promised land. And you've gotten distracted. We all can. We all can. We get in the promised land and God begins to bless us more than enough. And we get distracted. And we get away from Him and not following His ways. And not, not acknowledging that it's from Him. Each one of us can be pulled that way. God says, I want you to simply trust me and believe that the blessing that you're experiencing in the promised land is from me. Acknowledge me again. Let me, let me hear you. That it's my power that has given you the ability to create wealth. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to look at your word in a fresh way to realize that you've designed us to create. And Lord, all of us would a desire to be in the promised land and yet oftentimes we start in slavery and we need to be born again and brought out of systems of thought of how we think about you and in our our setting and then Lord many of us would law or the flesh I think would long to go from slavery to the promised land you said no need some wilderness time need some wilderness time because it's so important I'll take care of you in that place. I'll give you just enough. But I want you to learn how to trust me. I want you to learn how to trust me. And once that happens, God says, okay, you're ready to cross over. Take you into the promised land. But listen, it's going to be different from how you lived in the wilderness or how you lived in slavery. You're going to, I'm going to give you the raw materials and you're going to create. You're going to design. 
and it's going to be good and you have more than enough but that's who I am and that's how I want you to live the promised land raw materials, raw understanding and then I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you that's going to lead you into all truth and all that the Father has is going to come through me into you if you would ask and it's going to be an amazing an amazing life to show the world the goodness of God and that's what I've called my children to do. Show forth the goodness of God. So Lord, I pray that you would just come and straighten out our thinking and, and have us reach for that which you've called us to reach for and not miss any step along the way. Thank you again, God, for being a good father. You know how to grow us. And we love you for it. In Jesus' name.